he made said he said that that the the that the, there will be a by election. Mm. There will be a by election in Honorable Kwesi's constituency. How did he come to that conclusion? And he said that he may be disqualified from contesting. How did he come to that conclusion? Who told him that there will be a by election? And who told him that Kwesi may be disqualified? Is he having some conversations with the judiciary that we do not know? This is the most pedestrian analysis. Uh, uh, please, that's, please, that's, that's, please. That's a legal opinion. I mean, what legal opinion? Uh, an opinion. There is one, nothing legal. Once, once there is there a legal is, proceeding. There is nothing legal opinion about a case that has not been determined. Mm. The only body that can determine whether there will be a by elections or whether Kwesi will be disqualified from contesting is the courts. The last time I checked, Paul Adumachiri is not the court. The last time I checked, he is not even a lawyer. So on what basis is he given that particular legal opinion? Mm -hmm. He also said that Mike, uh, Michael Kwejina will win that seat and that he will win the seat. On what basis? On what basis? Uh, on, the, on the data he has. On what the data? data? The fact we that have seen people. He has won we have seen in the Don Kwabina constituency. I mean, th that, that makes it even, even so elementary. We have had people, consequences that, that Political parties' representatives mm. contested and won in the next elections. They lost. Mm. The fact mm. that Makukwe Jinya went into that contest with Ajoasafo, mm. and then Ajoasafo won even with the slimmest of margin, doesn't mean that if there is going to be a by election, there won't be primaries. You know, for that constituency, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the MPP that touts itself as people who are the doyans of our democracy, I don't think that they would want to impose in. Imposing, uh, imposing on him. What if they go to the primaries and a different candidate springs up? Now, what even prevents Ajua Safu from contesting? The last time I checked, she hasn't been sacked from the NPP. That is why I say that he consistently makes mockery of these two great people. How? Maybe, why? How? How? Plato, I mean, how does that happen? Plato and Aristotle were people who fought for principles. Mm. They stood for something. They didn't stand for their stomachs or the wealth of themselves and their families. They stood for principles. I, and I expect that if you display the pictures of these two people, you will stand for principles. But that you, you, don't think, you don't think, you don't that think my boss uh, uh, that Paul, Paul for principle. He has an appointment in this government. Ha his wife has an appointment in this government. What he does these days, you think that is a reflective of the good... You, good, you don't think he look, stands the for good, principle. Is, he has never case? been one. The good evening Ghana has been debased, unfortunately. And that is why I would have loved his on this program. I am not blaming you for debasing the good evening Ghana. I am blaming him for what he is doing. He has the right to do so. But, but, in a serious... But, in a serious democracy, in a that's, serious media house, you, he wouldn't be hosting the program. Do you, agree that, do you agree that the opinion is subjective? How subjective is it? It's, it's what you think. Of, of what, Paul what, said, he, what Paul said mm -hmm. in the matter of mm -hmm. a court, mm -hmm. in the matter of a case that mm -hmm. is before a court, mm -hmm. that is being determined by a court, mm -hmm. is not an issue of, of opinions. He made a conclusive statement. I sincerely apologize. I've been told that uh, Mutala is actually not a lawyer. He's a, a trained teacher with a, a master's in development something and a master's in international relations. Oh, I, I'm sorry. So now it makes sense. He doesn't understand starry diseases. I'm going to teach him tonight. Oh, Mutala, sorry. You, I thought you were a lawyer. That's why I was angry. I wouldn't have been angry with you. I'm sorry. You, so you, are not, you don't know anything about law. Uh -huh. Now it makes sense why you talk about a case in court. He doesn't understand the process of challenging a parliamentary election, which is provided for in the 1992 constitution, which I will show him now on the touch screen. He, he doesn't know. He's a member of parliament. He doesn't know that as a member of parliament, if he wants to challenge his um, election, or if he, yeah, he wants to challenge an election, the process ends at the court of appeal. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't understand all of those things. And I think that before he came to the studio, he didn't speak to Mahama Yariga and Haruna Idrisu. He didn't. They would have told him that, no, no, don't say that, don't say that. You don't understand it, so let's explain to you. I'm sure Mahama Yariga would have explained to him. Oh, Mutala, sorry. I didn't know. So you are a trained teacher. Oh, thank God. Teachers will always go to heaven, you know that. So that's fine. This is a trained teacher. Very good job. And a development analyst and international relations. Okay, that makes sense now to me. Okay, so now I will not take him to the abyss. I will just explain so that all of us can understand. Because nobody was born with the knowledge, where we? We all acquired it. So if you have acquired the knowledge, somebody doesn't have it. It's not, it's not a period to say that you are better than him. No, nobody is better than anyone because of knowledge. Because knowledge used to be acquired. But if you don't have the knowledge, don't come on TV and say the things he said. Now, he also said something about 
have debased the program. I don't know whether he's the program's manager here at Metro TV. <laughs> I don't understand. Good evening, Ghana. If it has been debased or it hasn't been debased, viewers, you can tell. Whether it's a better show now than two years ago, three years ago, you can tell. No problem. I will not answer that question. He thinks he's been debased and he showed up. He hurriedly giddy 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 came to sit on the program. <laughs> oh God, we are suffering all. Anyway, Mutala. Uh, I thought you were a lawyer. Now, you see, there's another reason why I like the guy. Because his name is Mutala. My first connection with the name Mutala is when I was very young. I was maybe 10 years old. My mother used to trade. She used to trade in Nigeria a lot, to go to Nigeria and come to Ghana. She used to go on DC-9. That's what they used to call the Ghana Airways uh, uh, aircraft equipment that used to go to Nigeria. DC-9, then later it was changed to DC-10. I didn't understand what all that meant. I'd never flown an aircraft before. But anytime she was going, uh, they were talking in the house about she's going on DC-9 and she, uh, that she preferred the DC-10 to the DC-9. I didn't understand. And so uh, the name Mutala was also in the conversation. So when they asked her that, what is Mutala? And she told me that Mutala is the name of the Nigerian airport. Mutala Mohammed Airport. That's the name of the Nigerian airport. So that's my first connection with the name Mutala. So it's a name that I really, truly respect. Then when I grew up and I studied political science, I understood that, oh, this Mutala guy was actually a great man. Later on, about six or ten years ago, I found, you know, I like gathering archival material. In fact, yesterday and today I've been gathering material for 4th August, which I'll share with you later. But I like gathering arch archival material. So I, I stumbled on this archival material, which then showed me why this name, Mutala, was such an important name in Nigeria. I was very excited. Permit me to take two and a half minutes of your time to explain my connection with this archival material, which told me about the man Mutala uh, Mohammed. That was his name, Mutala Mohammed in Nigeria. The reason why I respect the name so much, the reason why I was very slow to come to this uh, disagreement with Mutala in a violent way, and people have been calling me on Thursday, that, have you heard what he's saying? And I said, he's called Mutala, it's a name I respect, so we will deal with it later. And we'll deal with this more, more, more. I thought he was a lawyer, that's what annoyed me. Now I know he's not a lawyer, I'm fine, I'm no longer annoyed, I'm just going to explain to him that this is what it works. If he doesn't believe, he should ask the lawyers in his party, he should ask Mahama Yariga, he will tell him uh, what it is. But this is why I like, I, I, I mean, my connection with Mutala was that, oh, he's a hero of Nigeria, he's the name of the Nigeria, what's the name after him, as my mother told me. And now when I grew up, I, I studied and I said, oh, he was a great military leader. And then I found I cover a video why Mutala was great. This is what, so have a look at this video. Hello, Nigerians. Events of the past few years have indicated that despite our great human and material resources, the government has not been able to fulfill the legitimate expectations of our people. Nigeria has been left to drift. This situation, if not arrested, would inevitably have resulted in chaos and even bloodshed. In the endeavor to build a strong, united, and virile nation, Nigerians have shed much blood. The thought of further bloodshed, for whatever reasons, must, I'm sure, be revolting to our people. Murutala was dead serious. With amazing speed, he announced the forced retirement of all senior military officers a mass purge of the civil service and parastatals, probes of former government officials, the movement of the state capital to a better and more central location. He changed Nigeria's foreign policy to non-alignment and made it clear he would only make decisions which benefited Africa. He also announced a return to civil rule by 1979. To ensure public perception stayed positive, he announced a low-profile policy where the military was to no more act in an ostentatious manner. He himself decided to stay in his personal residence in Ikoyi rather than move to Dodden Barracks. It was clear Muratala meant business and the public welcomed him with open arms. Within three months, he became the most popular Nigerian ruler of all time. It was obvious to the Nigerians who watched the broadcast that day this man was different. This man was serious. 
this man could make the country change. On the 13th of February. Okay, so you now understand why I respect the name Mutala. Uh, the, if you want a, a lot of that documentary, you can share, you can give it to me. But we are, we are finding out more, and my people here are very clever, aren't they? Uh, Mikael is just finding out that Mutala actually has an LLB in 2016. So to say he's not a lawyer is not correct. So my, uh, my anger is back, okay. Because if you have an LLB, you should understand what I'm saying. You should, you should understand why I'm saying that the Asin North MPs matter is done, that there will be a by-election, and that he may not be able to participate in the by-election. Any lawyer should understand that. So I I'm angry again. The anger went, but it has come back because he has an LLB. You have an LLB, you have to be responsible to the... You have to have fidelity to the intellectual course that you have taken. So, Mutala, I'm coming back. I'm angry again, so we'll deal with it. Uh, but that's, that's why I respect the name. He also says something about appointments, and I hear this thing all the time about appointments, about appointments. I mean, when you are concerned about somebody having an appointment as a chairman of a board, can you just get his CV and look at it and make a determination that, oh, this CV can never be chairman of the board? Can you do that? You should take my CV and look at it. I mean, I've done all kinds of things. In 2013, those who are on this program will tell you, I used to live in Harare in Zimbabwe and in, in Johannesburg. Like all of 2013, and still doing Good Evening Ghana. I was coming in and out, recording some. I was working for clients there. I've done work in Nairobi, blah, blah, blah. It's not important because it doesn't mean anything. But when people say, you get appointed, take your time, okay? Find the person's CV. Put out the CV, publish it, and say, how can this CV do that? Then you are talking. But don't just kind of sit on TV and say, and he got an appointment. Mutala, you are a trained teacher. I have not said anything. You got your LLB in 2016. I got my LLB. I go and check, go and check. Tonight, I'll be talking about it, though, because we'll be talking about the law school matter. So I'll bring those things up. So once I finish the narrative, you can check it out, okay? I got my LLB from the University of Ghana. I don't know where he got his LLB from. But it's all LLB, isn't it? What is important is how you apply it and what you can do with it and how you can benefit society with it. That's the most important thing. And they keep talking about, you're not a lawyer, you're not a lawyer. The other day, I told them that nothing to take away from him. But if you say I'm not a lawyer, Kwame Ahoy too is not. Now look at the amount of work Kwame Ahoy has done in legal development. If you think he's not a lawyer, it's fair up to you and say it doesn't matter. You can say one is not a barrister, but to say one is not a lawyer is another matter. But all that is not important. It is about what you do with what you have studied. How society benefits from that. That's the most important thing. It's not I'm this, I'm that, I'm not this, I'm not that. When a person says something, you can then analyze what he says and says, oh, what he says is hogwash, what he says is correct, it's not correct. But not this, is <laughs> not this, it's not that. that. That has nothing to do with anything. Going on the touch screen, I'm going to articulate law. Let people say that is incorrect law. And then we are getting somewhere. But if you cannot say it's incorrect law, that is correct law, then your, your rumblings and all of that, um, you know, it's like a bee who is doing re, re, re. Okay. I'll deal with the issues straight up. So he said, for instance, that I said, and I did, that the by-elections in Domi Kwabenya, if it occurs, will be won by the MPP. And he doesn't understand why I said that. I'm even here seeing that he studied some political science, but that would be the most disappointing. If he studied political science and he's saying that even ordinary day one election coverage journalists can tell where a Dominic Kwabenya thing is going, why are they able to tell? Now, in political science, there's political research, and we're taught something. Where you see an event in politics recur repeatedly, it means that it will recur again. So on election night in America, if you watch CNN, you will see they'll put up a political election map. They will have some states as red, and they'll have some states as blue. For instance, in the election of 2020, CNN's coverage began with Atlanta, that is Georgia, the state of Georgia, painted as red because it's usually a Republican state. By the time it ended, it had been painted as blue. But at the beginning of the analysis, CNN and all the other news networks in America, Fox, everybody, all of them uh, predicted that Atlanta was going to go red, as it has been for the last many years. It was a safe seat for the Republicans. And so how did, how did they call it? Joe Biden was able to flip it. So at the beginning, anything can happen in Dominic Abeja because we're talking about human beings. But to suggest that somebody says MPP is going to win that by-election and that is some underhand dealings and it means that there's some connivance going on, that is totally irresponsible of a member of parliament. And that's why we see a few told him that it's based on the data he has. That data is not mine. It's data right here. So let's look at Dominic Abeja's election since 1992 and make a determination and shame uh, Mutala. Mutala, we are going to shame you tonight because it means as a member of parliament, you have not even acquainted yourself with the data of Dominic Kwabenya and then you were talking. Okay, so this is how it started. 
um, they start from 2004. That's when the constituency was divided. Before the constituency was divided, it was part of Medina, and uh, that side, MPP were winning all the time. So 2004, Professor Michael Quay ends up 67, 65% of the votes, and 32% go to the NDC candidate. 2008, uh, uh, Professor Michael Quay ends up with 57% of the vote, and 39% goes to the NDC uh, candidate. And then in 2012, 63% of the votes goes to the MPP, 35% goes to the NDC candidate. And then in 2016, 67% of the votes goes to the MPP, 31% uh, goes to the NDC candidate. 2020, 58% of the votes goes to the MPP and 40% of the votes goes to the NDC. So how many elections? One, two, three, four, five. Five elections. So if you multiply that by times four years, 20 years. In elections that occur every four years, and you have five election cycles where a particular party has won all the time by more than 50% of the votes, not, not a slim margin. They've always won a landslide. That's a safe seat for the party that has been winning. Tell Mutala that he does not understand political research. And for a parliamentarian, he needs to understand it because it is useful for his work. So Mutala, the reason why we say that if a by-election occurs today, the MPP will win is the data. And sometimes they don't do fidelity to the data. They are just talking. That's the problem, just talking without any intellectual basis. They don't, they're just talking. A whole member of parliament, we are talking about parliamentary seat, and you open your mouth and you are just talking. And he doesn't know the data. And when he is told that it's about the data, he says, which data? My goodness, which data? Really? The data of Domingo Abena provided by the Electoral Commission, the record of which is in that parliament where he's sitting. Mutala, wake up and do your work well. What is wrong with you? You don't understand data. This is the data. Four election cycles, MPP have won. So that's why I stood here and said that if there is a by-election, the MPP is going to win. He says he doesn't like that. Okay, now let's come back to the... So this is, this is sorted. If you don't think it's sorted, send your text message to Good Evening Ghana Official, and we'll read if you have more questions. So this is the reason why we said that if there is a by-election, MPP is most likely to win. It's strictly from political research. That's what we're trained. And as I said, it's not about what you are trained in. It is how it benefits society, okay? All right, so that, I've ticked that box. Now let's go to the other one, the more serious one. He talked about... Okay, Kweku, can you get them to put the law there? Okay. He talked about uh, the courts, that how do I know that there is going to be a by-election, okay? Because he, he doesn't even know what is happening. He doesn't understand it. So I'm going to explain how I know, not just me, but anybody with sufficient legal knowledge in the 1992 constitution can predict that there will be a by-election in Assun North. Even campaign has started in Assun North. Selections have started. Political parties, both the NDC and MPP, are talking about who is going to be our candidate. How did they know? They know because of the position of the law. And if Amaliba has any acquaintance with the uh, did I say Amaliba? Sorry. If Mutala has any acquaintance with the law, he would know that that uh, the, 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 the constitutional provisions and the processes that have obtained in the court so far is clearly pointing to one direction and is pointing to a by-election in Assen North. He doesn't know this. Maybe because he doesn't understand, I'll forgive him. But if he's supposed to understand and he doesn't understand, then shame on him. That's not to be forgiven. Shame on you, Mutala. You should read your law well as a member of parliament. You should understand every provision in the constitution that has to do with parliament. And the article I'm going to show you is strictly related to parliament. The article is under the subtitle of the constitution, the legislature. You are a member of the legislature. And you don't understand the provisions of the articles concerned with the legislature. That's crass. That's shameful. Don't do that again, okay? A whole Tamale Central, that's a big city you represent. Tamale Central is a big city you represent. It's an important city in the historical analysis of Ghana. You carry an important name, Mutala. Live up to it. Live up to your name, Mutala. Your name is important. Live up to it. Don't debase the name. What is this? Oh, okay. Let's start. Uh, what a starry disease is. Let me teach him something. So I, I'll go to it so that we can all follow. Now, I, I didn't know this. I learned it. If you don't know it today, you can learn it. Everybody can learn it. It's better if all of us learn it. That one knows it and one doesn't know it. It doesn't mean anything. Anyone can learn it. So let's learn it. All right. What a starry disease is. It is a legal principle. That means that the courts will follow principles in decided cases. 
that are of similar facts and provide the same issues for determination. The often used phrase, stare decisis, is derived from the Latin phrase, stare decisis en non queer mover, which is translated as follows, which is translated as, follow precedent and leave things at rest. So stare decisis means that when the courts have, so this is really a common law principle. When we say a common law principle, uh, or if you like, it's an um, Anglo-American common law principle. It means a few different things, but, but it's a fundamental principle with the common law world. Common law world is Britain and its colonies. Uh, the Americans try to distinguish a few things, so we call it uh, Anglo-American common law principle. Now, common law because it is with the common law. The other side of the law is called the civil law. Um, so we call those countries that practice civil law, the civilian countries. Quick example, the rest of Europe, Holland, France, da, 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 in Africa, South Africa, they practice civil law. The other fundamental difference in common law and civil law is that in common law, the judge is an umpire, solely that. In civil law, the judge participates. So you hear in the French world, they call them judge advocates. So the judge sort of participates. He can't participate in the trial. The judge can push his opinion in the trial. In common law, you cannot do that. So those of you who have seen court, you see that sometimes barristers will alert the judge that, my lord, you are participating. And the judge will say, no, I'm not saying, no, you are. This question is, is a leading question, my lord, you can't do that. Now, you can't do that because if you're a judge in common law, you are just an umpire. You hear something said that is so bad, you say nothing. You just let this person talk, and then you give your ruling. But in the civil law, they can actually do better than that. They can go a bit further than that. So that's, that's what we mean by common law, or if you like, the Anglo-American common law. Starry diseases is a fundamental principle of the Anglo-American common law, where if a case has been decided today in a certain manner, and you have another case that follows the events in that case. So let me give you an example. Uh, Kofi Menu goes to Makola and slaps uh, Kwame Mensa at Makola Market at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Kwame Mensa takes the matter to court through the police. The court rules that if you slap somebody at Makola Market at 12 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, you go to jail for two years. Okay. So when tomorrow, Abraham Menu also slaps Nakai at Makola Market 12 o'clock on Tuesday, when we go to court, the judge cannot do anything else but to follow the decision in Kofi Mensa. That's starry diseases. The judge is bound compelled, expected to follow the decision of the, the same matter that occurred before. That's stare decisis. That's a common law principle. So we can tell that Kwesi's matter will follow Adamu Sakande because it is the same. And then we know that Kwesi's matter has finished the process. The Court of Appeal has ruled on it. So there's nothing more to rule. Now I'll give you the details of where Kwesi's matter is and then you can understand how it came to a conclusion. But let's just finish off on starry diseases. Okay, so we move on. In the famous case of uh, Kimball and Marvel Enterprise in 1957, the principle is explained. The US Supreme Court described the rationale behind starry diseases as, quote, promoting the even-handed predictability. Have you seen the word? That's, that's what Mutala should learn. Starry diseases is supposed to help us all of us, you and I, citizens, journalists, lawyers, everybody, to be able to predict cases because we know that this has happened before and this is the way the court ruled on it. And therefore, once we are in a common law jurisdiction, if the same case comes again, the court will be bound to rule again this way and that gives us predictability. Where is he? Call him, call him that we are talking about him. He should come and sit down and let's talk. Then he should come and sit down and learn something. You know, okay, so the court, the thing says that the Supreme Court described the rationale behind starry diseases as, quote, promoting the even handed predictability and consistent development of the legal principles, fostering reliance on judicial decisions and contributing to the actual and perceived integrity of the judicial process. That's what starry diseases is. So we can sit here and say that Quasi's case will go the same way as Adamu Sakande's case because under starry diseases, there is predictability. So when you give the predictability, Mutala then thinks that 
what does Paul Adumotri know? He knows the judges. He, I don't know any judge. He knows this. No, no, I just study stare decisis. Mutala, if you study, you can predict without knowing any judge. You don't have to know any judge. Because if you study the principles and you know of Adamu Sakande and you know of stare decisis, you can tell that this, this case of, of Grayson is going this way. And that is what stare decisis is supposed to give us. Predictability is a fundamental canon of law. In common law jurisdictions, explain that to him, yeah? Mutala, I hope that you are learning. All right, let's move on. In this other case mentioned, the Court of Appeal, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now, quick, this is the one I said. Now, this is a story about how a judge um, decided something in the morning, in the first instance of the case. Second case, he had to bound himself by starry diseases, so he had to rule another way. It's too long. I won't go into it. Let's go on. Um, all right, so that's starry diseases, okay? So we understand starry diseases is the reason why we can predict. Now, how do we know that case, uh, uh, um, uh, Quayson's case is over? How do we know that? That comes straight back to the 1992 Constitution. And that's the point I was making. This article that I'm going to quote in the 1992 Constitution, which article is this, by the way? 99. Article 99 of the Republican Constitution. Now, open your Constitution, look at Article 99. That's what I'm going to read. 99 is directly related to legislature. Every member of parliament should be familiar with Article 99. Anyone who has contested elections as a member of parliament should be clearly familiar with Article 99. Not just that, but also should be familiar with the ruling of Dr. Seth Chum when 99 came up for conversation in the Supreme Court. You don't know this, Mutala. Then you come and sit here and you are talking. Just talking, just talking. No, you can't do that as a member of parliament. Other people can do that. You are not a rabble rouser. You are a member of parliament, not just a simple member of parliament. You are a member of parliament for Tamale Central. Important place. Not just that. You carry such an important name. If you go to Nigeria today, you turn up at the Nigerian airport and they take your passport and say, you are Ibrahim Mutala, they may even salute you because the name of the Nigerian airport is Mutala Mohammed Airport, named after a great man. This is the name that you have. And you have such a name and you will talk like this. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> all right, so this is Article 99. The High Court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine any question whether A, a person has been validly elected as a member of parliament or the seat of a member of parliament has become vacant. B, a person has been validly elected as a speaker of parliament or having been so elected has vacated the office of the speaker. Now, if you are a member of parliament and you are not sufficiently acquainted with articles, article 99, 1A and B, then I beg to say you are an irresponsible member of parliament. That's what you are. If you are a member of parliament like Mutala and you are not sufficiently acquainted with article 99, 1A and B, you are completely irresponsible and your constituents should have another look at you whether you should continue to represent them in parliament because this article and these two subtitles are directly related to parliament. And it is based on this that we can make that conclusion that there will be a by-election as a not. That's why we can make the conclusion based on constitutional provision. He ought to have known that. He's, he's, he's surprised about how do we know there will be a by-election. Mutala, with all that is happening and with the constitution on your table, every member of parliament doing the rotation, they dash you a constitution. It means he didn't even read it. He took it and he put it down. I'm sorry to say that. But Mutala, open that book. Parliament didn't just give to you. Taxpayer paid for it. You may be causing financial loss to the state, you know, because a taxpayer paid for the constitution that parliament has dashed to you. It's not a decoration. You don't put it on a table. You open it and read it. And read especially Article 99. And read all the articles related to you as a member of parliament. That's what you do. So that you are responsible and you are showing some fidelity to the people who have elected you in Tamale Central for you to come to Accra to represent them. You don't come and sit on TV and blah, 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 as if you are a nobody. You are not a nobody. You are supposed to be an honorable member of parliament. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Now, uh, two, it says, a person aggrieved by the determination of the high court under this article shall appeal to the court of appeal. So, when you are aggrieved after a high court ruling of sorts, the law says you appeal to the court of appeal. That's the natural way of appealing anyway, but there's something else. Okay, let's move on. This position was explained in the matter of Article 99 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana and in the matter of the presentation 
Representation of the People's Law 1992, PNDC Law 284, and in the matter of a parliamentary election for Wilensi constituency held on the 7th of December 2000. So this night, Article 99 position was explained by Dr. Seth Chum, one of the learned justices of the Supreme Court. He's no longer there. Dr. Seth Chum did a great job at the Supreme Court. Now, we're going to rely on him tonight as the foremost authority for defining the, the spread, the extent the control of Article 99 in the Republican Constitution. I hope Mutala is listening. Okay, so it says as follows, quote, in order that the clear intention of the framers of the Constitution may not be aborted, we are convinced, this is Dr. Sechtum speaking, we are convinced that this is a proper case to apply the maxim generalia specialibus non derogan, it's Latin, unquote. We hold that the appeal provision in Article 99.2 supersedes the general appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in Article 131A. Uh, 1A. Therefore, an appeal lying from the High Court in such matters shall end at the Court of Appeal. Now, why did Dr. Sechum have to labor to say this, which is now the foremost authority that we all work with? That when you, when you have a parliamentary election like Asin North, okay, and uh, the High Court deals with it, and you are not satisfied with it, you go to the Court of Appeal in the natural course of events. In the natural course of events, if you are not satisfied with the Court of Appeal, you go to the Supreme Court. That's the natural course of events. The Constitution, however, limited the role of the courts to, to end at the Court of Appeal when it is about a parliamentary uh, election dispute. So with a parliamentary election dispute, you begin at the High Court and you complete at the Court of Appeal. There's no Supreme Court involvement in that. So if an appeal from a, 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 a dispute in Ascent North has gone to the High Court, Quaison has lost, it's gone to the Court of Appeal, he has lost. What is left? It is the end of the matter. Doesn't he know that? That's what the court system have said. That's what the 1992 constitution, the fundamental law of the land, that's what it said. That's what the court system has said. Maybe he doesn't know that. So when Mr. Quaison's matter goes to the high court, the high court determined that Mr. Quaison was not eligible to, be, to stand for election. Same as Adamu Sakandi. What is their crime? Is it even a crime? Well, we can call it a crime. Deceit of public officer. The law says that. By the time you file your, your, your documents as a member of parliament, you ought to have allegiance only to Ghana. You should not have a, any other allegiance to any other country. You, ca you have to be Ghanaian only. You cannot be Ghanaian British, Ghanaian Canadian, Ghanaian Australian, Ghanaian Austrian, Ghanaian German. You cannot be that by the time you file the documentation. Now, the Supreme Court, in the, in the case of Zanetta Rollins, indicated at the point where the decision is made, because there are many uh, conversations. The case of Otien J and others before the Supreme Court in which Nana Kufado was counsel, all had different rulings on this issue of calendar time. At which time should the law determine that you have lied to the public officer or you have falsified statements? At which time? So the Supreme Court came out clearly in Zanetta Rollins. At the time that you file to the Electoral Commission. So it, it doesn't, it's, it's of no consequence if at the day after the voting, your processes to take yourself out of British citizenship completed. It is in October when you are filing the thing that you write that I, Paul Adomotri, I'm filing for the seat in Ladadekutupo, or I'm filing for the seat in Kwamo, or something like that. Is that day. So if I've been an American citizen, I finished University of Ghana, I went to America to study, I got an American passport, I, American, I, I married a Ghanaian who also has an American passport, and then I'm in America, and then my people are calling me, come to Ghana, come and represent that. Okay, so I come. And then I'm told that you cannot hold your American passport. So I called my lawyer in America. I said, can you begin the processes to take me out of American citizenship because I need to be Ghanaian alone. He doesn't finish. And then October 16th comes. And then the Electoral Commission says, file your document. Then I'm the candidate of the party. I go and file my document and they ask in the column, do you hold citizenship of any other country? And I write, no. And then the documents are processed. I win the election. February, my competitor, Yamansa, comes up and says, Paul Adumoshi, at the time he filed the thing, he was still an American. And I say, oh, oh, shame. I'm no longer an American. Today, I'm not an American. That's not important today. What is important is that on 15th October, was Paul Adumoshi an American? If the answer is yes, then Paul Adumoshi is in trouble. He's in trouble like Adam Musa Kande. He's in trouble like Quaison. And he will follow the same path. The court will rule the same way. Why? Because of starry diseases. You don't need to know a judge. You just have to know about starry diseases. That's all. You can make that prediction. So I think we are done with him, aren't we? We've showed why, if there's a by-election today, uh, MPP will win. Okay, the other matter. Why, how, he said, how did I know that Kwesin cannot contest in the election, in the by-election? I said that too. He said, how did I know? How did I know? It's simple. 
In Adamu Sakande, when the High Court determined that he did something wrong, he was prosecuted because what you've done is forgery. To say that I am Ghanaian only when you know, or as the law says, you ought to have known that you cannot do that. It's forgery. So Adamu Sakande was prosecuted for forgery. So Quason, most likely, will be prosecuted for forgery. That's a decision of the Attorney General. It's not my decision. The Attorney General will make his own decision. But if the Attorney General were to follow what happened in Adamu Sakande, which he ought to, he will be prosecuting Quason. If you go under that prosecution and you fail in the prosecution, you are an ex-convict, you cannot be a member of parliament. That's why we can rightly predict that when there's a by-election, Quason will not be able to participate in the by-election. Why? Like Adamu Sakande. Why? Because of starry diseases. Is that not simple? I believe it's a simple. Have we ended? Yes, we have. Okay. <laughs>